All right, I think we've got a good number of people, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sheila Vicaria, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Department of Research and Academic Engagement at the Drug Policy Alliance. For those of you who aren't familiar, Drug Policy Alliance is the leading national organization advocating to end the drug war. And today's panel is a part of a series that we are hosting and we are kicking it off today. And in this first session, we'll discuss the many motivations that researchers and community members have for centering those directly impacted in the research process. Although some researchers are themselves people who use drugs, many academics are not accustomed, incentivized, or trained to work collaboratively with people who use drugs as research partners. This panel will make the moral, political, and pragmatic case for community-driven research, discuss why it's important to go beyond community-based participatory research and explore how such research can build community power and ultimately make research more meaningful and impactful. So um, I want to let you all know that we are really fortunate today to have uh, interpretation in American Sign Language. As you can see, I am spotlighted as is one of our translators. So if you would like to access uh, live transcription and can't see the transcription now, you can click on the live transcript button on your screen or the three dots where it reads more and then click on the live transcript button. If you have questions or need assistance, message us, the hosts and panelists. The webinar is also being recorded and we will send the video of the event to all registrants in the coming days. And it will also be archived on our DPA YouTube channel DPA Voices, which we encourage all of you to subscribe to, to stay abreast of all of our events and to check out all of our archived materials. Um, how we will structure today's talk is that um, I will do a brief introduction of all of our speakers and then I will actually start posing questions to them. There will, no be, there will not be individual presentations, but there will be a moderated Q&A with my questions. And then at the end, there will be time for your questions as well. So as you think of them, feel free to add your questions uh, in the Q&A box on the screen or in the chat. We will be collecting them and we will make time for all of them at the end. Um, we are thrilled for this first part of this broader series, which is co-hosted by us at the Drug Policy Alliance, along with the Urban Survivors Union and the network of researchers with lived experience. And again, we are really hoping that today is the first of the four series that all of you plan on attending. And my colleague, Aliza, will drop the links to all the other sessions so you can register for those as well. So without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce uh, each of our speakers, and then I will pose kind of the opening question for today's panel. So Sarah Brothers is an assistant professor of sociology and public policy at Pennsylvania State University and research liaison for the Urban Survivors Union. Her research examines how vulnerable groups experience and respond to health-related issues. Her work primarily uses community-driven research, in-depth interviews, ethnographic fieldwork to focus on issues including uncredentialed expertise in practices by people who inject drugs, on issues of overdose, on issues of methadone treatment, patient perspectives on HIV and hepatitis C treatment, and issues facing youth experiencing homelessness. And next we have Amy Leibovitz. She is a sex, she's been a sex worker for over two decades, and since the early 2000s, she's been an activist with Sex Professionals of Canada, Fox, a sex worker rights group which fights for the elimination of stigma and the full decriminalization of sex work. Since recently moving to Winnipeg, she has also joined Sex Workers of Winnipeg Action Co Coalition, WAC, and Amy was a plaintiff in the successful 2013 constitutional challenge to remove some prostitution related offenses from the Canadian Criminal Code. And currently, Amy is working on a number of community driven projects. And we also are thrilled to have with us Katie Simon, who spent 20 years in the low income rights, psychiatric survivors rights, sex workers rights, and drug users union movement. She's a leadership team member and a sex work liaison for the Urban Survivors Union, the National Drug User Union. And Katie is also the co founding co organizer and co-executive director of Whose Corner Is It Anyway, a Western Massachusetts harm reduction, mutual aid, and organizing group by and for low-income street and survival sex workers who use opioids and or stimulants and or experience housing insecurity. 
From 2013 to 2020, she was co-editor of Kids and Sass, a seminal media outlet by and for sex workers, which was featured in the New York Times, The New Yorker, and other prominent publications. Danny Ompad is the Associate Dean of Education and Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Deputy Director of the Center for Drug Use and HIV Research, also known as CEDAR, at New York University School of Global Public Health. She is an infectious disease epidemiologist whose research is focused on the health and well-being of people living in urban settings. Her work is focused in the areas of urban health, HIV, illicit drug use, and adult access to vaccines. And she'll be speaking uh, specifically also on her work uh, as part of the, the network of drug researchers with lived experience. And lastly is Shauna Ferris, who is an associate professor and program coordinator in women's and gender studies at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada. She researches and teaches in sex work and prostitution studies, critical race studies, the ethics of community-based research and anti-violence feminist activism. She also works with local and national advocates and artists in these areas. And most recently, her work has appeared in the International Journal of Qualitative Methods, and she is the author of Sex Work in Canadian Cities, Resisting a Dangerous Order, a collection she co-edited with longtime sex work advocate, Amy Leibovich, who's here with us today, Sex Work Activism in Canada, and was published in 2019. She and Amy also work with a number of researchers and activists from across Canada on the Sex Work Activist Histories Project and with Winnipeg researchers and activists on critical inquiry into Manitoba's John School. So as you can tell, we have quite an esteemed panel of speakers with us today, and we are thrilled to be able to learn from each of them. So to kick off today's discussion, I wanted to pose a question to all of our panelists and anyone is invited to join us to respond to this question. But how would you first define community-driven research? And in what ways is it different from what we might typically think of when we think of community-based participatory research? So how would you define it? And in what ways is it different? Oh. Okay, I, I guess I'll jump on this one, if that's all right. Um, so basically, so um, we're pursuing CDR, because uh, while well, CBPR, it, it encompasses a lot of great research, it's a super broad category. Um, and so it can go all the way to like, just advisory board membership, which can pro provide little time to contribute to a project or people with lived or living experience administering surveys. So CDR, it facilitates much more engagement. It, can get at what researchers don't know and don't know what to ask about. So the experiences and information that's not in the literature. Um, so by getting, engaging people with living experience, it allows, for instance, for survey design, interview guides to more fully address current needs, concerns, and practices. Um, so just really quickly about uh, what we're meaning by community-driven research or CDR, this model that we've been using. Uh, so members of the impacted community um, are fundamental drivers and full collaborators on all aspects of the project, from initiating and developing the research questions to data interpretation analysis and the dissemination phases of the project. So CDR, it really emphasizes community initiated research questions, leadership capacity development, community engagement over the entirety of the process, and importantly, community decision-making powers over data dissemination, including the speed and the medium of findings dissemination. So this approach, it really inverts the top-down approaches to generating research questions. It can also alter the research structure on what knowledge gets produced, what's considered data, who collects data, and what purposes data can be used for. So CDR, it can really lead to innovative research questions that don't only build on existing literature, but go beyond it. And I think it's really important now, especially in a time of crises without much precedent, fentanyl, xylazine, overdose rates, uh, the consequences of COVID-19 stay in place orders, just a few. So much, Sarah. And I saw that Katie uh, popped in um, a recent paper in the chat, and I wanted to invite you, Katie, to uh, to add to what you hear from Sarah, but also um, reference what it was that you dropped in the chat. Sure. So that is um that is a 
commentary that we published in the International Journal of Drug Policy entitled, We Are the Research, the Researchers and, Dis and the Discounted, the Experiences of Drug User Activists as Researchers, um, which kind of, um, which details many of our interactions and some of the challenges posed in our interactions with researchers um, during our recent work around, um, around the changes in methadone regulations and uh, just methadone maintenance treatment issues that came up during COVID-19, but also uh, goes on to outline our mo the model of uh, community-driven research as we see it, as it relates to uh, you know, drug use research. Um, and so I had just had like a very broad sort of follow-up to Sarah's much more detailed answer, you know, and more, in the, more of the difference in, in the spirit of both endeavors that you know, community-based participatory research deigns to allow limited participation according to academic researchers' predetermined structure for including it. And so, for instance, that might mean limiting participation to community advisory boards who have no real decision-making power or really even enough paid time to give meaningful input on a study or hiring people with living experience to administer a survey that they had no input in designing. So then they're scapegoated for the study's problematic elements by their own community without actually having been responsible for them. So that ultimately the power imbalance within the activist, activist academic binary remains unquestioned static within CBPR. Whereas CDR consciously mediates that power imbalance through co-leadership and continuing dialogue shared between the two camps. So, CBPR invites community members to an already laid table, whereas CDR, which includes driving the research at every stage of it, including the nascent ones, allows us to set that table together. Thank you so much, Katie. I love that uh, setting of the table kind of analogy. Um, and Amy, I see you nodding your head, and I'd love to invite you in to speak uh, from your perspective. Oh, yes. Thank you. I totally agree with what everyone um, has said so far. Um, I think I would um, add a couple of things where I'm like thinking about community driven research is where you're not starting anything without community, right? Um, and when you're approaching community, you're approaching in a service, how can I help you? What do you need? Um, way. Um, and it's important like not to just sort of repeat what other people have said here because it's been really great, but I would um, add to it by saying um, researchers um, doing that have to, like, I think a lot about um, where you are coming from, like why can you be trusted? Why are you wanting to work with our community? What personal stakes do you have? And what do you gain from this kind of research? So like researchers needing to be super upfront about what they get out of this personally um, and also professionally. Um, advancement of career, for example, just as like one example. Um, but I think, um, I think of also about when we're talking about community driven where it's like coming from the community you have to have some kind of connection with that community. Like you have to build some kind of friendship or connection to that community, as opposed to just sort of, as Katie put it, right? The other type of um, research with community where it's participatory, where it's the researcher deciding and then they're coming along and, and sort of asking you to fill in the gaps and connect them with people, so. Those are some of my, my thoughts that I wanted to add. Thank, Thank you. you. And this next question, I'm going to invite in Danny to kind of um, to contribute. Um, but what do we mean by when we, when we say community? And in what ways uh, does that affirm perhaps a binary between who is researched and who is the researcher? And uh, Danny, can you speak a little bit about your work with the network and how you've also kind of worked to try to complicate that binary? Sure, so I've always thought that the idea of who or what organization is defined as the community is, a little challenging. Um, is it like, for example, I work with an organization in Ukraine that is the umbrella organization for all the harm reduction programs in the country. Is that the community 
or is that the organization that's serving the community? Is the community the social workers that are providing the, um, the services to people and or is it the uh, people who are receiving those services? And maybe it's all of those. And I often think with CBPR, you're, it, it, the, the people at the table are not always everybody that needs to be served by the research. So um, we kind of organized, um, Ingrid Walker and I, along with support from Drug Policy Alliance, um, a very loose network, and it's called, we call it NERDL, kind of insp inspired by uh, um, Drug Policy Nerds, um, uh, which is a network of drug researchers with lived experience. And this came out of one of the reform conferences where uh, we set up a community forum for drug researchers at whatever level, whether they were outreach workers, kind of recruiting participants, interviewers, phlebotomists, um, project managers, students that were doing research, investigators, but um, who are interested in talking about their lived experience with drug use um, or not just sitting there and listening. And what, what amazed us um, in this community forum is that it ended up being standing room only. Uh, there was like 60 to 80 people crowded in a, one of the smaller uh, conference rooms that we had. And people were very um, passionate um, about the topic and very touched, I think, at their ability to share some of these experience, their own lived experiences, and being made to feel like that was not a value added to the research. So there are, um, I don't know how large the number is, I don't know the proportion, and as an epidemiologist, you know, I'm very careful about saying how many or you know, what percent, but there are an, a substantial number of drug researchers who have lived experience, um, meaning it's anything from marijuana use to, um, to heroin use, to cocaine use, to alcohol use, all kind of across the gamut. And not everybody is uh, are former drug users. There are quite a substantial number of people who are drug researchers, even in academia, even in positions of power, who are people that use drugs, but are not really provided the, the space and opportunity to talk about that and to reflect on how that may impact the types of research questions that they ask or the way that they engage with others in the community that may be using drugs. So I've kind of found this fascinating. And just so you know, my concern all along has been that there are a group of researchers who do drug research, who not only have not used drugs themselves, but may not have ever spoken to somebody who uses drugs. And I worry about the conclusions that they draw from their research when they're, that they may be stigmatizing communities or not really understanding what's going on by just looking at the variables in their data set or the way that animals behave or cells behave in a petri dish, um, but possibly creating damage to communities by the way they talk about their research. And so to me, that really complicated the idea of who, who, who the community is um, and to make sure that um, as researchers, we kind of reflect our own um, positionality in that to the extent that we can, understanding that not everybody um, feels um, that they have the autonomy to do that, that they, some people might have a lot to lose. Yes, thank you so much for, for putting all of that out there. I think many of us um, find ourselves when we are often um, in spaces particularly with funders or with researchers, you know, it's, there is a greater culture now in researchers being able to talk about having lived experience being currently in recovery. But this idea of being a current or active user um, is still kind of um, the last frontier and an area that some people still don't feel comfortable doing because of so much of how academia is built. Um, Katie, I see you uh, turned your camera on, but I was wondering if I wanted to just invite Shauna if, if Shauna wanted to contribute anything to this question. If not, Shauna, I will definitely pass the next question to you first. 
Oh, that's fine. You don't need to uh, ask the next question to me if you, if you had someone else earmarked for it. I just, I had something to say about the first question, but I can yeah, wait maybe please. until the Q&A and see if it comes up. Oh, okay. All right. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, Katie, did you want to uh, jump in? Sure. I just wanted to uh, jump on this question of problematizing this, you know, um, this community slash researcher binary, because I think uh, one of the first things I noticed in our literature review for that IJDB commentary on CDR um, is that uh, CBPR lit in drug use research has a real problem conceptualizing people occupying multiple roles. Like the very existence of academic researchers with lived experience wasn't a possibility acknowledged by most of the very language of this literature. But that also doesn't mean that a researcher who partied and cammed in grad school occupies a, sim a similar material position to a criminalized, multiply marginalized drug user or sex worker organizer. Um, it also doesn't mean that being a drug user or a sex worker organizer is a monolithic position without hierarchy. Um, one of the things that a reviewer challenged us on rightfully in our IJDP commentary was to what extent we could claim to represent multiple intersectional drug user communities. And Sarah has more to say on that, but our method is focused on not only allowing access to the research process to the most privileged drug user and sex worker organizers, but the binary isn't even like entirely static. In previous speeches on this topic, I've, I've talked about how drug user organizers will sometimes go back to school for an MPH or a PhD, but then that detaches that organizer from the observations of their community from the ground which make us most beneficial to drug use research. And that's why we're actually asking for a way to create a spectrum in this binary. One of the many things we were requesting in the IJDP piece was intermediate training and research skills for some of us, which are transferable. And this is also why fully funded, fully funded centers for research by and for people who use drugs will be necessary. We want a sustainable way to influence research about us while also being able to continue organizing and retaining our connection to the broader collective work. What we ultimately want is to straddle this binary, allowing for research participation to not be extractive from the organizing, but contribute to the organizing. And I think that what further complicates this binary also is that often the academic researchers we form the most enduring relationships with are junior, um, sometimes people with intensive lived experience themselves who can also be multiply marginalized, something which further stigmatizes them in their own field. I mean, I don't think any academic in this audience is unaware that grad students and assistant and adjunct professors also may experience economic and employment precarity. Um, they might actually have more in common with some of us economically and socially in some ways than with, than with senior researchers in their field. And given this existing vulnerability, the fact that this work can be risky, unprofitable, and time-consuming is a real challenge. And I'll pass it on. Thank you so much, Katie, for highlighting all of those intersections and complicated nexus points to consider in terms of thinking beyond monoliths and binaries. Um, Shauna, I wanted to invite you in to respond to, to, to kick off the responses for this next question. Um, as a researcher who's now been doing community-driven research, can you talk about what it's been like for you in your career and what benefits have you seen in uh, involving community members in your research? How do you feel like it's improved your own research um, and what benefits has it, has it given you and what insights has it given you? Um, and in what ways do you think it may also make the work more ethical? I'm happy to talk about that. Uh... I mean, we've, we know from the studies that people have talked uh, about the, how, to, how to do data with community groups. Like the more community involved in research, the more community involved in like major decision-making and directing research, the better the data you get and the more reliable it is. The bigger the data sets, the more, the more participation you get, the better the research is. So uh, from my own experience, it, it does that most certainly, but uh, Amy and I do a lot of, um, trying to collect and record and tell activist histories. And for me, involved, like be doing community research means having way more fun. Uh, having uh, people who partner on the project, who on, on various projects for whom the project is meaningful because they are the ones who sort of suggested that the project should happen. And uh, talking to some of the folks on this, for the example, the Sex Work Activist Histories Project um, having their histories told or finding ways to create digital records of all of their things. 
um, which is something that's a very personal process for lots of people, uh, has given them a great sense of, but it's also been a super amazing working in partner and non-experiential person in that context. It's also been a process of unlearning some of the academic training uh, that taught me that, you know, I, I have a role to play as a researcher and it's a very specific role and it's a regimented one. And in fact, it's the, the role can change. And uh, in fact, community driven research is a means of putting community at the helm or uh, at the, that, you know, creating the restaurant and then setting the table to borrow Katie's very valuable metaphor there. Um, it is a, it's a way of, of uh, doing exactly what Amy said as well. What do you need? How can I help? And then getting out of my own way in order to make that happen. I have some, uh, some comments prepared for one of the later questions on this point, uh, because I, the unlearning process for academic researchers is part of it, but then there's a part of the process that involves uh, recognizing what it can be like for non-academic folks to work with big institutions like universities and some of the language that gets tossed around in those spaces and just sort of trying to prepare, like be in a, be a meaningful mediator and worker and researcher in those contexts where uh, institutional language is often quite uh, dehumanizing to non-academic uh, researchers. And I don't know that the I don't know the institution of the university has caught up to uh, the kinds of the kinds of community-driven research that's happening. So we have some work to do to reform it there. Thanks. Thanks, Jana. And Sarah, I wanted to invite you in if you were interested in kind of talking what it's been like for you to be at this early stage of your own career in moving in this direction um, and what that's been like for you um, in, in forging this path for yourself. Um, that's a super interesting question. Um, and, and so, Katie and I, we've been talking about this a lot because, you know, of course, this is totally collaborative. So we've been like, you know, had a Google Doc going back and forth, and we've been talking about this. Um, and there's definitely, and there's enormous benefits, but there's also definitely perils to um, community driven research, um, especially at this very, very early as a very junior researcher, because it, it's super time consuming. Um, takes a lot of mentorship and support and thinking about the research process from multiple perspectives, um, it's, which is incredibly rewarding to really think through like our own preconceptions, um, as I think uh, Sean is going to talk about later, um, you know, how to frame a research question, how an article could be structured. Um, but it's hard to sustainably fit with other demands on time. Also, one's academic contribution is not necessarily legible. Um, for instance, in our use of it, we've moved away from single authored pieces. Um, and I love this because I find it really interesting to find a way to center people uh, with living experiences, voices, uh, concerns and experiences, and play with removing my own kind of subjective uh, perspective and my ideas on what's important and what's not. Um, and so I think for the work that's come out of this project so far, this approach of foregrounding um, collaborative voices was the right one. Um, however, I do think that there's work that could have a more traditional approach to dissemination. Um, you know, like, you know, researchers who use uh, CDR methods produce a collaborative white paper, for instance, so the results are out quickly and then published separately in academic journals. Um, and we've been doing and moving more in that kind of direction of publishing advocacy work quickly, and then the academic work can proceed at a different pace. So yeah, so rethinking these normal forms of practice is really rewarding, but finding a balance between communal work and communal identity and individual work, um, very different worlds. And that balance has definitely been hard to achieve. Yeah, sure. I mean, as someone who abandoned the tenure track, I do recall the pressure though of the first author or the solo authored uh, paper. And for, you know, for this pressure to take ownership of this knowledge creation, as if this was somehow something that could be contained and owned by an individual person. Um, and so I totally, I totally hear that from you and the pressure that comes with that. 
Um, Amy, I was wondering if I could invite you in at this point to talk a little bit about what it's been like from your perspective to be involved in, in this kind of research. You know, what has it been like for you? What was it like for you the first time you were involved in a study? And in what ways um, did, you, did you learn to see yourself differently through the process or were you able to uplift the voices of your comrades? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, <clears throat> yes, I can. Um, I think um, for me, I've, I've been, um, like before I got involved um, with um, Shauna and doing collaborative and community-driven research, I was, um, I have been the research. <laughs> so I've done like countless um, studies for 20 bucks, you know, <laughs> or a gift card um, and participated in other people's studies. And then I meet Shauna like 2011 and it's just a, a different world. It was like, there was an ability to, um, bring my community into a space that regularly um, views us as um, the researched, um, not, um, um, not people who have, um, that, like, that our stake in it isn't the same, that like we are somehow, um, because um, we're not, um, we don't have degrees or we don't have certain types of um, credentials that somehow we um, were not seen as, as, as equals. And so to be brought in um, as an equal, right? And, and, and um, sort of helping to bring other people into that space um, has been super rewarding. And at the same, like super rewarding and amazing. And at the same time has really highlighted for me, um, and maybe this is a later question, but um, has really high, highlighted for me some of the, the issues um, that come up uh, with it. Um, but positive issues are that um, we are building this like beautiful, like for example, just one of our research, we're building this beautiful archive that's gonna have um, community um, uh, recorded histories and it's gonna be framed um, from a decriminalization and rights-based approach to sex work. Um, like um, they're gonna be able, people are gonna be able to tell their stories in a way that is gonna honor their stories. And so that's, that's a beautiful thing. And participating in research that like we have this John school here in Winnipeg, which is super fucked up. It's where they um, arrest, they pose as sex workers and arrest clients and then trick them into um, uh, what they call like reformative, like they pay a fee and then listen to like a class of people telling them how bad sex work um, is for, for, for women and all of this stuff. And so um, we're like investigating that, like, SWAC has been able to um, drive a project where we can investigate something that's harming our community. And that's like a beautiful thing to have um, researchers and academics who are using their power within, the, within academia to get us grants to be able to do this important work that's gonna help, or the hope is that it's gonna eventually help our, our community by maybe shining a light on this horrible, program that exists, for example. So, yeah. Thanks. I, I, I love hearing you talk about something you're so excited about. I mean, it's so clear what an impact it's had on you to be able to be involved in these opportunities and to, to tell your own stories. And I was wondering, Katie, did you want to jump in and talk about what it's been like for you in recently or any projects or anything that you've got on the docket or things that, that you're hoping to work on? I know that in light of COVID, there, there has been some work that you've been doing. Do you want to share about anything that uh, you haven't discussed already? Uh, sure. I think the primary thing that we haven't discussed already has been the other uh, major piece of community-driven research that we published recently, um, which is an editorial in the American Journal of Public Health, which was drawing on uh, 
drawing on our methadone manifesto, um, it's entitled the methadone manifesto treatment experiences and policy recommendations from methadone patient activists. Um, and yeah, um, I, Hmm. Let me let me think a bit more on that uh, question, Sheila. You can come back to me, I suppose. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, Danny, I wanted to invite you in. Um, so this is just kind of a pet question that that we wanted to pose to the group, but I have a feeling that maybe you could offer um, an, an example. But you know, can you of several studies in your field, specifically in public health or epidemiology, where it was so clear to you? that the person had never spoken to someone with lived experience or had no real understanding of what perhaps some of the subjects or participants in their study was going through that could have explained their findings? Yeah, so there have been some white papers from economists. Um, I was so irritated that I don't even want to remember the author's names um, that basically really showed that they don't know what they're talking about, um, not only in terms of um, the people's lived experiences and, and, and what's important, but also in terms of methodology. <laughs> so as an epidemiologist, I found them irritating. And then as a human and the way they kind of talked about people, quite frankly, really pissed me off too. Um, and uh, Sheila, you may remember the authors um, better than I do, but, but those papers are really damaging because they really feed into narratives for some policymakers, And so they'll like grab those papers and hang them up as see the researcher said that, you know, these people are bad and, and harm reduction, I think it was harm reduction doesn't work and you shouldn't invest in harm reduction. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Do you even know, like, do you even know what you're talking about? And so I find that things like that very, very, um, damaging and harmful. And it, it kind of goes back to my childhood where my parents said, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Like if you're going to say negative things about a whole um, area, then you might want to talk to people who work in that area first before you go running your mouth. Um, and it was clear to me that they hadn't talked to harm reduction um, providers, they hadn't talked to clients of harm reduction programs, and uh, quite frankly, really damaging and irresponsible on their part. Yeah, and um, uh, Katie, please, by all means, jump on in. Yeah, and I also think it's, oh, am I? Uh, no, I'm not muted. Oh, marvelous. Um, gay tech difficulties. So I think it's a, su a subtler problem like than the one problematic study that everybody wants to rag on on harm reduction aligned research or Twitter or like the obviously methodologically flawed studies that don't even have the benefit of peer review, but which somehow gain real legs in public discourse. Like in a sex work research context, you know, Melissa Farley comes to mind and the whole bunk stat about the average age of initiation into sex work being 12 or 13 years old. But entire genres of drug use research where exist where it's obvious that our perspective has been totally excised to the detriment of the research. Like since I've been a reviewer for a NIDA contracted systematic review, I've encountered an entire genre of papers about what a wonderful opportunity the overdose crisis is for organ donation or all of these legal papers and suggestions and public health paper recommendations about how we can navigate the quote legal challenges involved in violating pregnant people who use drugs privacy so we can drug test them more. Or maybe it's even just a question of even more subtler framing. Like in a literature review I did recently, I saw so many references to the quote, overutilization of emergency departments by people who use drugs, rather than posing the problem as the barriers to access to preventative care for us, right? And I think focusing on just like the really obviously uh, messed up studies uh, allows us to kind of lose sight of these uh, subtler and more entrenched problems. And, um, and maybe you want to stay on for one second just to add a follow up question to this. Um, I think one of the other invisible variables that's often not present in research about drugs and drug effects and people who use drugs is the invisible or not so invisible role of criminalization itself and policing and law enforcement contact. And, um, and I would love to invite you and Amy, perhaps even, to kind of talk about how when research is done, just accepting at face value certain, certain things 
and not and even making invisible the ways in which the state and criminalization um, can actually uh, disrupt people's lives, but also affect what we think we're seeing as a objective reality um, in, in this research. I mean, I think that the the one of the examples I just raised like really uh, grounds that. I mean, also I just think like, I mean, and this has been discussed before. Uh, you know the the Philippe Bourgeois idea that harm reduction just becomes another like list of like neoliberal moral imperatives. If it's divorced from any sort of like structural analysis, then it's just a way to make people feel like shit for you know not using clean needles when those clean needles weren't available to them um so you know and then also just like the way that public health discourse is so compartmentalized from criminalization as a structure like since we started doing this methadone work you know i've been involved in so many you know like i'm sitting on a, a local county opioid task force methadone work group etc and you know, and in that public health discourse, it's just like, well, you know, criminalization is just the superstructure in which we all live, you know, let's talk about like the, the, the closest they'll come to even really analyzing it or approaching it is like the whole social determinants of health framework. But, you know, I, I don't really, I, I don't really encounter the idea often that like, okay, great, well, you know, why don't you break out of this compartmentalization and realize that your moral imperative as a, a health service provider or as a public health researcher is to advocate for decriminalization, you know, and, and then also just like the hmm, the impulse to or, or like, you know, an even more dangerous and more subtle impulse, which is to say that medicalization will somehow be a utopian substitution for criminalization. Thinking about, um, about what Katie's saying in the question, um, could you repeat the? Yeah, sure. You know, one of the yeah. things that happens in research about these so-called high-risk practices or high-risk behaviors yeah. is that we put the onus on the person for not engaging in health-promoting activities, what have you, right? Rather than acknowledging the role that the criminal apparatus and policing and surveillance can actually play in the kinds of choices and options that we feel are possible or feasible in our lives. Um, so if that gives you anything to go off of. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, that was great, thank you. Um, I think um, certainly with, um, with sex work, I think we see, um, I think we see a lot of, um, like the removal or like not understanding um, how um, stigma um, and criminalization of our work and the different ways that we're criminalized and that goes beyond arrest, um, how that really plays into people's lives and the things that we have access to and um, in society. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no pressure, no pressure. I just thought I'd invite you in to talk about that. But <laughs> I appreciate I think, it. I, I do think stigma is another kind of unspoken um, or um, kind of whitewashed term, right? We talk about yeah. um, implicit bias among providers. We talk about um, these other constructs that sometimes whitewash the real the real reality. Thank you, Z, um, in in the chat. Discrimination is is what it's called, yeah. right? And how that can have a direct impact. Um, on these outcomes and um, can be real deterrence from seeking so-called help from the helpers, right? The healthcare providers or the systems that we supposedly think are there to serve, right? Um, yeah, did, did you wanna jump in again? Sorry. No, okay, yeah. So um, I, I guess I could, you know, open this up. I think, you know, we've got a little bit more time uh, for, for our individual discussion before we open up to audience questions. But we were already starting to dip our toe in this, but I would welcome folks um, to, to jump in and talk about, you know, what are some of the challenges or the perils of this research? Um, folks were kind of alluding to this already. I see Shauna has raised their hand. Uh, please, by all means, Shauna. 
Thanks, Sheila. I'm just going to try to remember to put my hand down so it's not super distracting. Uh, I'll keep my camera turned off because I'm worried the road moving behind me is going to make people dizzy. Kind of makes me dizzy when I watch. Anyway, um, so I wanted to uh, sort of riff or build a little bit on what Amy had said and thinking about some of the institutional challenges to doing um, the research that we have done are the ways that the institution of the university will require or try to require certain kinds of information to be shared, um, not only with researchers, but also with the sort of accounting infrastructure of the research institution itself. And that affects or can affect whether or not people are willing to work with us. So for example, um, we've had to push back on this in various ways, and I'm not going to talk about our specific strategies, but if people want to message Amy or I about the strategies we have developed, please do. We are happy to email with you about it. Um, but essentially, we have a situation where every time we pay people to work with us, and we always try to pay people to work with us, yes, I've obviously, I, I, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping I'm speaking to a group who knows this, um, academic researchers, with the exception of students, as someone has already mentioned, um, are paid for the work that we do, and the people who work with us deserve to be paid appropriately. Um, but granting structures often don't include the language we need to uh, create positions that are paid for our community partners, and we've developed some strategies for that, so please do message around that. Um, And All right, then Shauna, we just lost you a little bit. The itself requires, even when paying honoraria, uh, our institution, so the University of Manitoba, can you hear me better now? Uh, yes, can so we just heard the, no? we heard the last sentence that you said about being paid honoraria, but we missed some of the earlier sentences. Okay, did you hear the part where um, granting institutions don't have language for paid yes. positions for community members okay yeah so please message if you want to talk through that we haven't uh, written grants in the U US we've written them in Canada but if there are folks from Canada who want to talk to us about it we are happy to uh, brainstorm solutions with you but um, in the terms of the honoraria so if people are working with us on a one-time basis and we still pay um, and we pay in Canada Cash, even though universities are increasingly um, reticent to let cash payments go to people, and there's all kinds of ethical or unethical reasons for that, I would suggest. Um, but when we pay, then the accounting structures and the folks associated with them at the university often try to get all of the information, including in the Canadian context, it's called a SIN number or a social insurance number, um, which is very personal information in addition to other kinds of banking and address information for each of our participants. Um, and the way we read, and Amy and I have looked very carefully at the, doc, the ethics governing the studies that we do, the way we read the documents, um, folks can provide that information to us as researchers, but we do not owe that information to the university. We protect it. So we've also found workarounds when people are not uh, willing or interested in sharing their information, because of course they shouldn't have to in order to do research with us. Um, and if folks want to email about that or message us about that, we, I'm happy to talk about it. But there, there are lots of ways that as when you do community driven research, you, you as a researcher, if you are in an institution in, in, a, in a position where you're having to um, write grants or start to facilitate research that actually puts community in a an empowered position. In many cases and spaces, you are going to you, you not only have to translate institutional language for community members, but you have to translate community driven research methods and ethics for the institution itself. I'll stop there. I'm happy to talk more later. Shana, and it seems like you inspired Danny to jump in and I and I'd love to hear from both Danny and Sarah from the US context, you know what the counterparts that might look like from your experience here. But yes, please Danny go ahead. So I've had some similar challenges um, at two different institutions in the US. One is a university, one was a nonprofit. The nonprofit was a lot more flexible 
Um, but at the university level, we've ha basically had to train the, C the IRB to understand the particular needs of the communities that we work with. And often they, they just don't get it. And so then I get a little bit stroppy and a little strong armed and, and kind of point out where they're being unethical or paternalistic. And that usually works, although I try to deploy um, that type of behavior uh, judiciously. But then the other thing we've sometimes had to do is deploy the IRB against accounting. Um, because the, uh, the accountants want us to, I think, as Shauna was talking about your SIN, they want like social security numbers so they can report um, uh, participant reimbursements as income, like after a certain point. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. That's not how this is going to work. So you're either going to let me do this the way I need to, or I'm going to stop applying for grants where you get the indirects, because this does not work for, um, for a study where we have a certificate of confidentiality, um, which automatically comes if you're asking about um, behaviors that the, that the government decides are illegal. Um, and so it, it does take a lot of effort to kind of make that work and also to provide the type of incentive that participants find acceptable. Um, so like I had, I had the, um, the accountant say, we want you to give gift cards. We don't want you to give cash. And I was like, well, gift cards don't work that well. And they're like, well, please do it. And I said, what about if I do a, um, a little study and tell you what's acceptable to my participants? And basically, like some said, yeah, we'll take gift cards. And the other ones were like, absolutely no, we want cash. And so the next time I go back, I'm going to be like, here's the evidence. And by the way, if anybody wants it, I'm happy to share with you that, you know, our, our little two sentence thing that construction workers in New York want cash, not gift cards. But it's that level of, of challenge that you can face in trying to respect the communities that you work with when the institution is unprepared um, because it doesn't fall into their um, accounting um, framework. Um, and, and, you know, indirects are a really good leverage in the US context. Um, and indirects are basically money that the institution gets paid on top of what you charge um, or what it costs to do the actual research. So depending on the institution, they could get 60% on top of what you get to do the research. And that's pretty, that gives you a lot of leverage. Thanks, Danny. Thanks for those little hacks and also for the freebie citation. I have a feeling that there are people on the line who will, <laughs> who will definitely take you up on that. Sarah, did you want to hop in um, and have anything to add? You're welcome to do so. Oh, yeah, I'd love to. And then I would love to, to put it over to Katie. Um, I know she has a lot of, of good words on this subject. So um, first, yeah, the um, been very lucky, like a uh, avoid the whole gift cards and cash instead. And Penn State has been super supportive with this. And we have like some language, some citations that that support that, that, that we've been giving out to other researchers to try to get their IRBs to approve cash payments instead of gift cards. Because as Katie could talk about, there's a lot of problems with, with gift cards. Um, so yeah, so as I said, so Penn State's been super supportive. They've got a community engaged research center um, that really understands it. So I'm really lucky and then seed funding for it. Um, but we've also been kind of thinking about other ways researchers can contribute, um, particularly for junior scholars, grad students, like, uh, you know, uh, kind of work trades, um, like skill training, um, kind of uh, um, working on other projects, doing other collaborations outside of the research project, that sort of way um, to basically, you know, expand the kind of innovation that can be done in community-driven research. So Katie, you've been invited to hop in. Oh, okay. Um, and we are still on the perils of, of engaging with researchers, correct? I feel like we've wandered far into the weeds here. All right, great. Um, so like most interactions with researchers that we have are actually a chance to learn about new perils, engaging with them. Like I like to think of it as gathering experiential data from our perspective on academic norms. Um, 
One thing I talked about in another recent DPA panel is that I do think studying drug use research community norms, like how drug use research interact with each other, their institutions and their funders hierarchically, and making a material analysis of how this research is implemented from our outsider perspective is actually really important. Um, I think as Amy said, you know, uh, answering the, having researchers answer the question, how does this benefit them exactly? Um, and what, like how, what, how does this contextually relate to your career advancement? Because, you know, I, I've had the experience many times of, of taking a meeting and not really, not really understanding it, you know, having it be this like big oblique black box of uh, other people in this very disparate community's motivations. And then to have, you know, Sarah give me just like a few notes on uh, where this person was materially in terms of like, you know, how they relate to other researchers and where they were in their career, having it all suddenly, you know, make sense to me. Anyways, translating knowledge from the ground that can save lives into research can never really be accomplished if like the structure of this research itself is not examined. And if understanding can't be reached across the academic organizer binary. So I think that drug use researchers might need to start getting comfortable with uh, being the research themselves. Um, and one thing I've seen personally is that the phenomenon that we wrote about in the IJDP piece that researchers will often try to divide and conquer by nominally including an organizer leader and then expecting to buy access to our population or our collective intellectual property through them keeps happening over and over to me, even or especially with people who claim to have read the IJDP commentary and loved it. They'll often do this with little time for me to offer response or respect for my numerous other time commitments, which creates this pressure filled time crunch for me to offer a yes or no without fully being able to do an informed risk benefit analysis of the opportunity. Um, they approach me as an individual, creating resentments between me and other community researchers or the academic researchers that we have longer standing commitments with, with no conception of how to interact with us as a collective body or to offer us benefits as a collective body. Um, and so, and, and this is also partly just, you know, a problem of differing norms, as, as Sarah was saying earlier, but there needs to be some translation of these individualistic versus collective norms at some point within this, in these ongoing relationships. Um, sometimes I feel as though my relative experience with these norms of academic research are being exploited. I mean, I've lived to see more sophisticated examples of some of the bait and switches we've discussed in the IJDP commentary offered such as claiming there is funding when there is none or offering partnership on a large grant application that doesn't manifest after the input or the letter of support that they sought for a smaller project is offered. It often feels like in meetings with researchers that we're bartering a letter of support, what is ultimately actually valuable for a researcher's grant, for a good faith effort towards our inclusion or our driving some part of the process if we're really lucky, which is not actually necessary to academic researchers to fulfill their career goals. So right now we're asking individual researchers to choose to try to mediate this power imbalance between academic and community researchers voluntarily. But I think ultimately we need to institutionalize CDR in the academic infrastructure. For example, Nabarun Dasgupta often mentions the idea of asking drug use researchers to voluntarily put down why a particular study didn't include participation from people who use drugs as part of its limitations. But I'm interested in what would happen if drug use journals required such a statement as a matter of course, like right along with one's conflicts of interests. And speaking of uh, Navarun Dasgupta, as we both discussed in a previous DPA panel, there are ways to create space for significant contributions from communities in all types of research projects, including big data studies and not just qualitative research, which I think is sometimes often overlooked. Thanks so much, Katie, for touching on so many of those key points. Um, I wanted to now transition to, um, if, if none of my panelists wanted to jump in on this last question, Oh, Amy, please come on in. I will be very, I will be very brief because I'm, I know it's time, but um, you got plenty of time. We got okay. half an hour. Take your time. Um, so I was, I, I was just thinking about what everyone was saying and and some things that stuck out with me, um, in my experience, like in terms of with me and Shauna, have been um, the academic structure itself, um, uh, being a barrier, right? And like some examples that I think about. Uh, that we've had to contend with, um, have been, and we've written about it um, on our uh, blog, 
our ethics review boards, um, which I'm not sure what they're called in the US, um, but they um, are clearly, <laughs> at least to us, uh, not very equipped to handle, um, for example, the level, level of expertise that, um, that community researchers hold, like have and hold. Um, and even just the ethics certificate itself, when I think about it, the fact that we need them um, is to me from participating in the, in the really um, toxic um, back and forth that me and Shauna have had uh, with ethics re review boards. Um, it's, it's clear to me that they are set up in a way to protect the university um, from uh, liability and not um, the actual participants. Um, and so, um, like for example, an, an example that we had was we were invited to go, um, we were invited by activist groups, an activist group to go and record their history. Like, so they invited us and we need an ethics certificate and which I think is <laughs> very interesting just on its own. And then once we, once we had our ethics certificate set up, they wanted us to include this um, horrible line in the bottom that said that um, it's mandated that we, um, um, uh, that we're, that we're man that we're, we are mandated to report any child abuse. Um, they wanted that included in the in this in the certificate or in the um, in the consent form. And anyway, so you know I can go on about that, but we had this whole back and forth, and and Shauna was quite amazing, telling them basically fuck off, and that's why we're not doing that, and why that's horrorphobic and um, super harmful sentence to be placed in a um, in our uh, in our sheet. Um, for our consent form. Um, so anyway, lots of assumptions um, about community, um, about myself in the whole process of trying to research as a community-driven researchers and community members trying to navigate that. So those are some of my, some of my thoughts about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for for complicating that. If the community is already telling you they want the research, <laughs> then this kind of interesting bind that you're in that you still have to jump through the hoops of the institution because it just presumes by the research occurring that it is occurring on the terms of the researcher, right? Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So um, we have lots of fantastic questions that have come in through the chat and the Q&A box. So I'm going to do my best to, uh, to, to go through as many as possible with our speakers. So um, I guess this is more of a question for the researchers. For those who want to actually um, do this research and for people who use drugs who want to break into doing this research, do you know of any funding streams that are available for people who use drugs themselves to be able to start this research or to do any of this kinds of work? Um, perhaps you know of funds that people have been able to tap into or, or sources where this money is available. Does anyone know of these kinds of sources? I'm assuming the researchers, but maybe uh, Katie and Amy know of sources. I will be honest, most of the sources that I know are leveraged through organizations, not to individuals. Um, and it can be very difficult. Um, so I just had this conversation in a meeting before I got on this to uh, provide funding to uh, an organization that wanted to do a pilot study. And mm -hmm. it happened to be international, so there was a whole complicated set of questions that needed to be answered that may make that a barrier to providing that funding. Um, so for individuals, less so from the kind of federal government types of funding. Um, sometimes there are opportunities, like if there are small grant pilots to fund individuals, but those are usually targeted to people who are researchers in training, for example, regardless of your status as, as somebody with lived experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess maybe this brings up um, a, a, a good gap for us to acknowledge in the, in the lack of a funding stream or a publicly well-known public 
you know, funding stream for this type of research. And, you know, oftentimes we do have folks in the philanthropy space uh, who attend these events. And so I think this is definitely a plug for those of you who may be on the line or in the audience or watching on YouTube after the fact that uh, to consider this a potential area of funding. And again, because so many folks with lived experience would count as researchers in training or researchers already with burgeoning experience from already collaborating on studies with folks who are already attached to these academic institutions, for instance. Um, all right, so on to another question. Um, I think that Katie kind of touched on this, but I'm going to pose the question again. Um, uh, you know, what positions of power uh, do you see yourselves and your co-creators or collaborators in the community as having, oftentimes in relationship to the community as whole? Do you see yourselves as being representative of your communities or having much more complex uh, relationships with the communities you represent? Can uh, Do folks want to respond to this? I feel like Katie alluded to this and kind of touched on this, the intersectionality, but um, we're being asked this question again. Um, yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this briefly, but I think Sarah also had some really interesting things to say on this. Um, so if you don't mind going to her next. Sure. Um, so whenever, it's very hard for me to not associate, you know, like the question of, are you representative <laughs> with this culture of confession that exists in organizing, you know, in movement spaces, in organizing, in more in broader public discourse, uh, you know, like what you're actually asking about is, you know, my connection to suffering as, you know, or or what is often actually being asked about is my connection to suffering as determined by like my relative precacity. Um, and the thing is, like. People are privileged and marginalized on like many nuanced uh, ways that coexist with each other. Um, and like, you know, I don't I don't think that I should need to like, you know, uh, talk about the ways that, you know, like list out the ways that I am currently marginalized in order to prove how representative I am necessarily. Um, and I know Sarah introduced me to Eve Tuck's incredible work on, on damage-centered research, and I'd really love for her to go on about this. So, yeah, so we've been talking about this a lot. Um, like, what, it, um, what does this mean? And um, that sometimes it does seem um, that drug use research is defined by like the authenticity of suffering. Um, and sometimes that can, include or focus on extreme poverty or other forms of precarity. And so we've been attempting to pivot from, as Katie mentioned, Eve Tuck's um, uh, damage-centered, you know, what she calls damage-centered research, which presents a view of marginalized communities as depleted, ruined, and home hopeless. And so instead to, as she writes, reimagine how findings might be used by, for, or with communities. Um, so some of the ways that we've been dealing with this is, um, you know, like for instance, in our methadone work, really foregrounding people with living experience in methadone treatment and having people with direct experience, expertise in, in specific sub issues contribute to those sections, such as sex work, homelessness, pregnant and parenting people. And we've really been working on developing really inclusive methods. Um, so we do this by trying to facilitate low threshold engagement. So for instance, we do a lot of our work in Google Docs to include people that don't have personal computers or might not have um, their own internet access. We also use a whole lot of different methods to review documents. So talking out sections, um, summarizing, doing summaries, um, facilitating the involvement of people that really prefer um, and are really gifted at contributing verbally um, because academics, we have particular proclivities and skills. We wanna just kind of sit in silence and type. Um, and that's not necessarily, doesn't have to be that way to produce great research. It doesn't have to privilege this engagement with the 
written word to be community engaged. Um, and there's a bunch of other things too that we've been working with, like like flexible meeting times, um, you know, and really just trying to remove um, a lot of the stresses of research participation by placing the research in spaces and communities where people already feel um, heard um, and paying attention to how people want to participate. Oh, Katie. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, I felt like my response to that was a bit flat and I just want and a bit confrontational and abrasive. So I did just want to add that, um, you know, like, yes, of course, like my, uh, you know, my relationship to my community is complicated, you know, as are all organizers relationships to their communities. And like even participation in this work changes that position right um and is continue and is continuously changing that position and is in flux um but like i think that you know one of the problems with like interfacing with you know um environments in which there is considerable material power like in in policy and research spaces is that it, there feels like there's this you know um scarcity mentality Right. And that and that another problem is, as I said earlier, that researchers have this, you know, that even when there's this idea of involvement beyond simply being a subject, that idea is focused on an, like an individual community leader being representative, you know, and then having that token co-author credit or whatever else. Um, and that's why we're that's, and so that's why we kind of what we really try to emphasize in USU is for that benefit to be trickled down and to be passed along and so that it isn't just like a focus on the advancement of one person who then becomes like this tokenized slash representative voice. Um, and that actually brings me to another thing that I wanted to mention, which was that um, you know, one of the one of the biggest challenges of this work for us has been this huge tension between um, between inclusion and efficiency, right? Like both between academic researchers and community researchers and among community members, right? Like we're attempting to do this work, like partly in an academic setting that has its own rhythms and deadlines, like in the context of these academic norms, which are individualistic rather than based in collective work, as I keep on saying, and they value some skill sets over others, as Sarah pointed out, and they monetarily value some things over others, right? So. For example, the AJPH piece drawing on the manifesto began its first draft working in larger meetings, but then narrowed down to a few of us. And even those larger meetings were filled with those of us who had more of a left brain based skill set, as Sarah pointed out. Um, and the manifesto itself drew from months of those of these sorts of unfocused focus groups, Sarah's coinage, um, and then narrowed down to more of us writing it, but even still ultimately represented a smaller group. And we're constantly trying to like, mediate um, this sort of narrowing in our process and thinking about it intentionally. Yeah, no, thank you so much for bringing all of that uh, together. And I don't I don't think I perceived it as contentious, uh, but I do appreciate you coming back to clarify and adding more richness to your response. Um, because absolutely, I think there is something about efficiency and speed. And with as few people as possible, things move a lot quicker. And unfortunately, what I keep experiencing as someone who also gets invited to write letters of support as a community member is the rapid timelines that people are often working under. They have a resubmission deadline, they have to do their edits, they owe something back to the editor. And it's not really responsive to the fact that people have competing priorities, competing things going on. Um, and you know, the tenure track is not my priority. It is not my job, right? And so all of those things are um, absolutely, I think, really, really important for us to consider. Um, so we have another question from the audience, and I'm wondering who would be interested in jumping in, and maybe several of you have opinions about this. So how do folks frame the evidence that ultimately comes out of your community-driven research? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, because there's a lot of evidence for what, or there's a lot of bias in what gets counted as evidence. Uh, and, you know, we talk about evidence-based treatment or evidence-based policy. So, um, you know, clearly you're not using CDR to conduct randomized controlled trials, which are the pinnacle um, of what produces uh, gold standard, you know, research. 
So how do we balance um, giving, uh, giving credence to the quality of evidence and research that comes out of CDR with the recognition that so much, even of the social sciences, has moved towards this idea of randomized controlled trials or even quasi-experimental research designs as being as providing the most clear and objective scientific data. Um, I see Danny jumping in. Yeah, yeah, I just think we should reject the being somebody who was involved in a in a random a cluster randomized trial and has been involved in a cluster in a cluster um, quasi experimental study. Uh, I think it is fair to reject the notion that um, RCTs are the gold standard of evidence for all research questions because they're not, um, and there are lots of ways to. Uh, provide evidence for research questions that don't involve trials and might not even be observational like epidemiologic studies. And this is coming from an epidemiologist, so that's a little bit of heresy. Um, but that's not the only way to produce evidence. It absolutely is not. And there are lots of ways to produce evidence and lots of ways to record it and lots of ways to interpret it. So I think we should dispense with that notion that the RCT is the be all and end all for all research questions because it's not. And sometimes it's asking, it, it is the wrong method because it's asking the wrong question. And sometimes it's the wrong method because it's fundamentally unethical and could subject people to death, right? So much of the interventions that we, we promote in harm reduction involve immediate intervention, immediate access to an overdose prevention center, immediate access to fentanyl test strips or naloxone. And this idea that there has to be a control group that could very well die uh, in the name of showing the efficacy of an intervention that feels fundamentally unethical. 20 years into an overdose crisis here in the United States where we've already lost over a million people. And we also know that the rates are absolutely devastating in Canada. I do not know your numbers, but I know just as devastating, if not more devastating in many parts of your country. Um, and so I, I totally appreciate uh, that contribution. Did anyone else wanna jump into that question about how they navigate the bias towards randomized controlled trials or Shall I move on to another audience question? I, I just wanted yeah. to add very quickly, I think it can be approached as ethnography or autoethnography, form of qualitative mm -hmm. research. Yeah, thank you. thank you. I also think like we've kind of set ourselves up for this in harm reduction culture by, you know, enshrining and fetishizing uh, evidence-based research, uh, evidence-based practices, right? Like that's one of our talking points, it always is. Right. And so we need to be able to like put an asterisk up there and say that, you know, experiential data is also evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Quantifying what we even mean by or qualifying rather what we mean by evidence and the ways in which we tap into various pools of, of evidence and knowledge. Absolutely. Um, so someone is asking from a researcher, uh, a student, a junior researcher perspective. Um, does anyone have any tips? on how they can advocate internally at their institutions um, and among their mentors or with their mentors to support CDR um, as a student or a junior person in a system that may not be uh, as aware or as, as open to it. Any tips or strategies? Maybe Sarah, can you talk? Oh, oh, and Shauna, yes, please Shauna, jump on in. Sure, yeah, I can, I can talk briefly to this. If, uh, Am I clear? I'm driving yes, through a storm, you're... so I might be chopping. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I think as a junior researcher, you need to ask, um, you need to ask the people who supervise you for the training that you need. And some of that is a like a process of managing up. Yes, and we do this in all kinds of different areas of our lives. When you have less power, the person above you knows less, but you have to pretend they know more, then you ask questions that are leading them to give you the training that you need. And then the other thing that you need to do is make sure that you have strong relationships with the communities with and for whom you want to do research so that you can jump through the academic hoops that you need to jump through. If there's no one who can mentor you through, um, then the best thing you can do is maintain your relationships. Make sure that you're no, no part of your study, no part of it should be a surprise to the people that you are doing research with. There should never be an email from you to anyone in your study 
that they're like, what the hell, I haven't heard about this study before. Every single piece of the study should be something that people know about and that they are involved in. And the more you, the more relationship maintenance you do, the more community, non-academic uh, community members will train you to do the research that you need to get done. So if you can't get the mentorship at the institution, then you can most certainly be a good community member and get it from the community members uh, that you serve and with whom you're working. That was excellent. Uh, Sarah, did you want to hop in or are you good? I, I just really quickly, it's not a great answer. Um, I, I do other more traditional recognized studies simultaneously, at least one or two. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to play that, you know, one of your, one of the strategies is maybe having a foot in both or doing the kinds of things that you need to. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, another question. Um, how do you balance setting realistic expectations about what change is even possible? People in our community are tired of all institutions making promises that they don't follow up on. However, researchers often have limited ability to enact change itself or themselves. Does anyone want to take that one? Any thoughts? I think it's. Um, I can. Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Oh no! Please, please. I'm. I only have something very brief to say, um, and this is possibly something Amy should be saying because she said it to me. Mm -hmm. um, I had spoken to a couple of uh, older academic researchers who had had mentored me and whose work I had read through my career and they were on the verge of retirement and they were speaking really discouragingly about the ability to enact change through research or the ways that their research had been used uh, sort of or hadn't been used to make to make the changes that they wanted to see made and in talking this through with Amy this past winter um I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say it as well as she said it to me in those contexts. But essentially, what what I came to understand, and what I came to understand again, maybe in that context, is that the changes that we are trying to create, no matter how much they are needed by communities in the present moment, very few of them are going to come in our lifetimes. <laughs> like these are changes that we make for the generations that come after us, um, and we try to do what we can in the moment for um, to serve the most pressing needs but the bigger, wider, more institutional changes we want to see, every piece of research we do, everything that we do in the context of the community-driven projects in which we engage is one brick in the wall that builds towards something else that we may never see. That was so poetic. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I, I, I really, I don't know. I never thought of it that way. Um, Amy, would you like to jump in and to... To add to that, do you recall what it is that you might have said that that inspired Shauna to say that? Oh, something similar. Um, um, I can't. I I can't remember exactly, but I do. I do remember thinking about um, with with sex work research, with sex work policy and law. Like we had this like amazing. I guess what what sort of I think where it came from for me was that we have all these changes that we're doing like as activists, um, trying to like dismantle um, uh, horophobia and stigma against sex workers and criminalization of sex workers. And we like won this amazing case in Canada. And there was like this brief moment of like beauty and then we like lost it in like an instant, like almost like like a year later we were um, in an end demand um, mm. model, which is a, a model where um, sex workers are viewed as always victims, can't consent and our clients are criminalized and we're criminalized in, in different ways. Um, and so um, that sort of really like huge loss made me realize 
Um, and I've always known it, but I think it, like, it just made me realize that like, it, it's, we have these like little gains and like we lost, like we won that case and eventually like we lost it. We have none of those gains, but all the gains that we do have are like that it can be done and that it will be done again. And, and I've spoken to sex workers from different parts of the world that are like inspired by like the ability to just do things like that. So I think that's the, um, I think that's, I think that's where it came from for me is through my activism. I, you know, 20 years of sex work activism, I'm realizing that it's, it's these collection of histories, making sure that the histories are like told by sex workers and that they're not framed in this institutional way. Like archives are usually right hidden away in a, mm -hmm. in, a mm -hmm. in a university and they're storied a certain way and tagged a certain way and like how we can do that and how we can just sort of slowly try to chip away at the things we can do and in the hopes that and so that all can be replicated in in research, right? Like that's that all can be done um, with communities in research like Shauna was describing. So that, that's where it came from for, yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah. knowing that if, if you have the win once, it's possible. I think that, yeah, that's a really important thing to hold on to. So we have two minutes left and I see Katie's hand is up and I'd love to give Katie an opportunity to hop in. And then if possible, just to give 30 seconds, if there was a call to action you could give or make uh, for the audience, I would invite each of you to hop in. But Katie, um, I did see your hand if you wanted to, to jump in or if you wanted to make your call. Um, I guess it's both. I mean, I think that that long view perspective is certainly necessary for like long term sustainability of our efforts, right? Um, to be able to fight another day, etc. But I also think that there's a real urgency in our work. Like when we first talked about this panel and like making an ethical political and pragmatic case for uh, community-driven research, I was like, I'm not really interested in, in making an ethical case because hopefully you all either know it or, or hopefully can intuit it. But, you know, I'm interested in a pragmatic case because, you know, in a time which people are dying as we speak, like research is consistently on a huge time lag for when it could have been relevant to saving the lives of people in our communities and producing like what I like to think of as no doubt research years after the fact, when it's only new within the academy and when drug using and sex working communities have moved on to try to stem the next crisis, right? Um, and I would say that there's like a note of hope too, because like, you know, without us having been able to get a truly community-driven perspective, uh, like the Methadone Manifesto, into the American um, Journal of Public Health, um, we couldn't have had one of our co-authors, Abby Coulter, on it as part of a planning committee for an ONDCP-sponsored workshop and revising methadone regulations. Methadone regulations that have been, you know, static for and unchangeable since the 19 fucking 70s, right? Sorry, um, and. You know, um, I think that, uh, you know, like there just, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm blame, I'm brain blanking, but, you know, um, I think that if in that, in that space where public health can, uh, it can affect policy to the very limited extent that it does, I think we do have a moment right now when this model is at least becoming available to discuss where we have to keep pushing on this. And I think that the call to action for academics would be to try to move so that CDR is not just a choice that you're making within any particular study, but a, a part of the academic infrastructure so that, you know, we're, again, so that we're not being invited to that table based on a whim, but that we're like a set part of the guest list in order to, <laughs> to string out my, uh, my metaphor into uh, absurdity, but yeah. Thank you so much, Katie. I actually think that those were wonderful words for us to end on. And so um, on behalf of us at the Drug Policy Alliance, thank you so much to our panelists for spending time with us today and sharing their valuable expertise. Thank you to our interpreters, 
for making this event accessible uh, to those who are tuned in today live and who will be watching later on on YouTube. Um, if you support the work that we at the Drug Policy Alliance do, please think of us the next time you are giving. And also we have shared links to give to the group that our uh, panelists are also affiliated with. Um, it's really important to put your money where your mouth is. And if you support this work, it's important to show it. And sometimes money is the best way to do it. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you at the rest of this series. Thank you so much for joining and have a wonderful rest of the evening.